to feed the senses. A collection of recipes especially for summer. Join Delia Smith for a summer collection, Friday at 7.15 on BBC Two. A bicentennial feast now on BBC Two of your favourite food and drink. Special welcome to what is sadly our last program of the current series. But happily, we've got something to celebrate too. This is our 200th program, though you've never guessed, would you? And we don't look a day older than 199. Since we started, Gillian Oz have tasted 5,000 wines. Actually, I should think many more than that, going back as I do to 1982. And that says nothing of the teas, coffees, milks, orange juices, Caribbean love potions. But it's not Caribbean love potion today, it's wine. We're revisiting some of the wows of the last 10 years and looking at the latest incarnations in the shops of things such as wonderful Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand, Chardonnay from Moldova. Uh, how did I miss those Caribbean love potions? Never mind, if I can concentrate, I'm talking about the new wave of reds from Chile and Spain. And we're going to show you a classic food and drink cut tonight when Sheffield lorry driver John Wilcock travelled through France with two Michelin-starred chef Raymond Blanc to cook and eat with Raymond's mother. Okay. Well, she just says that she's extremely happy to welcome you home. And uh, I hope that you're going to enjoy her hospitality. Yeah, it's very nice okay. meeting you, Mother. <laughs> and in the past 10 years, man and boy, but mostly man, Michael has demonstrated more than 500 recipes. We ask you to vote by phone for your all-time favourites. And joining us here today are a few uh, viewers who voted for the two winners. You're all going to get a chance to eat the dishes later, I promise. But before that, out of Michael's 500 recipes, what are the two most popular? Well, more than 16,000 of you voted, and Michael has the result. The savoury dishes had a close-run thing, but the winner was this salmon en croute, which is layers of salmon, herb force meat, and puff pastry over the top. Wonderful dish. But I'm afraid there was no competition at all in the puddings. It was the crafty chocolate cake all the way down the course and around the corner. Well, Brenda Howarth from Manchester and Eileen Richmond from Coleraine in Northern Ireland both voted for the salmon en croute. Brenda, are you a, are you a, would you call yourself a good cook? Um, I don't know. I think you'd better ask somebody else about it. I think you're probably very <laughs> modest. Eileen, you've had a go at this dish before, I believe. <laughs> yeah, I cooked it for a dinner party. And how did it go? Um, well, mine's was a bit squat, a bit like a pregnant goldfish. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about a pregnant goldfish, but then there's no koi carp in this, but it is a very simple dish made with salmon and some haddock. The basic process is to start with some puff pastry. I usually buy mine and, and simply roll it out. You can buy marvelous ready-made puff pastry these days. And this is a filleted and skinned piece of salmon. Put that in the middle of the puff pastry. You'll see I've already scored sort of feather marks on it. And I'm going to make the stuffing now. This is some haddock, about 12 ounces of haddock. I'm adding that to six ounces of white breadcrumbs. I just finished cutting it up. It's well to cube the haddock before you try doing this. And a processor really is important. It used to be done by hand in France. It took about an hour to, to do. But this way, it's much easier. Add an egg and the juice and rind of a lemon. Good pinch of salt. Little black pepper and some oil, sunflower oil in this case, about three tablespoons, but enough to make sure that the blades work, but without adding any extra cholesterol. The last thing, really, or the last two things, are some herbs, some parsley, which you can either chop up a bit first or tear up as you put it in to make sure it mixes properly, and some of these chives. Fresh chives all the year round these days. Lovely to be able to find them in shops and supermarkets. Again, just cut them a little bit so that they blend in easily when you put them into the uh, food processor. And then the lid goes on, and this turns into what's known as a farce or a force meat. It doesn't matter how exact the proportions are. 
to the size of your piece of salmon because it makes, if you bake it separately, the most marvelous fish patty as well. But what I'm going to do with this, though, is I'm going to use it to stuff, as it were, the salmon. Just dollop it on. It doesn't have to be in too careful or precise a pattern at this point, though it's best not on the puff pastry itself. <laughs> Flatten it down so that it looks reasonably neat because another piece of salmon's going on the top of that like this. Now, as you can see, the, the pattern's beginning to develop, but before I cover that with the puff pastry lattice, let me get one out and get Chris working. This is what it's going to look like when I finished. You can see uh, the lattice work, which I'll show you how to make in just a moment. But my friend here, which way around would you like that? That way around. I think the head would be now pleasant. The, what I want you to do is to uh, practice your skills. Serve slices of that. There's a, there's a cream sauce and a, uh, uh, another one. And another cucumber. one. Cucumber. <laughs> cucumber and fromage spray yeah. sauce. And you can choose what you like. Fine. I'm meanwhile going to do this. The trick with this is to cut a whole lot of little, as it were, feather-like strips down the side of the pastry till you get close to the head end of the salmon. And then you plait them. I've cut them reasonably carefully, but I've re really not uh, bothered to do them too perfectly. And you just keep going, plaiting as you go, and you'll see that the pattern builds up with the help of a little egg wash, a little beaten egg, just sticks it all together like glue. So you get a very, actually it sticks together like glue without the egg wash. <laughs> Is the problem. How are you doing over there? Well, it's not perfection, but then I always thought perfection was rather tedious. Do you want to sample the sauces to see which you think are the most perfect? Which do you recommend? This well, looks... that's a cold one. Cucumber smells it's, wonderful. It's got a nice sort of sharpness. The other one's a rich sauce made with, uh, made with cream and the fish stock from the salmon. You've I've got, got, some, got, you've got some spoon in the sauce. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> don't get it out and lick your it's fingers. It's one of those right? days in the kitchen, we've Michael. You guests, know how it is. We've got guests, and I don't want any licking of the fingers <laughs> job today. All right. No, exactly. Now then, I've just about finished here, except for putting the head and the tail on. So let me uh, just finish this little bit here and show you about the head and the tail, because there are a couple of little things. It's very, it's very artistic, this bit. What you do is you cut a shape on the tail, like that, and you can make markings, if you like, to simulate the uh, bits and pieces. And the head is a wraparound job. You. Uh, Put some more egg wash on and fold it all over so that the salmon has a kind of fish face shape. And then a little roll, if you'll pardon the expression, of pastry, also egg washed on, dollop the eye on. And I've got here some numbers because it's our 200th birthday. A little bit more egg wash, a zero, and another. Zero, and I was, I've been using the kind of cutters you use for cookies or children's party cakes here. So here's a two. And if I can get that the right way round, yep. There we go with the two. There's the 200th salmon. Now that goes into the oven for about 35 to 40 minutes, 400 degrees Fahrenheit. That's uh, 200 centigrade, 180 degrees in the fan oven. Gas mark six, and if you've got an arga into the middle oven of the arga, Let's be honest, I've made a right pig's ear of this one, but I our guests are very so. understanding. <laughs> <laughs> our guests are, gonna, our guests are going to be kind. Serve from the right. I, I mean, it tastes wonderful. It does look <laughs> slightly <laughs> irregular. However, Thank enjoy. Jilly and Oz have tasted their way around the globe to bring us the very best value wines over the past 200 programmes. The present province of Navarra, much smaller and concentrated entirely in Spain, of course, also has a history of winemaking. And Alsace is a wonderful place to eat for someone with a big appetite like me. So this is it, sunny Baden, and it's raining. And actually, this is supposed to be the warmest vineyard in Germany. In Britain, we're accustomed to European wines, which are named after their place of origin. In California, it's made much simpler because they're named after grape varieties. You've got to have sun to ripen your grapes. And that's where Australia uh, wins over other countries. New Zealand's only a young wine-producing country as yet. But my belief is that we in Europe ain't seen nothing yet. 
New Zealand. I love the place, and most importantly, I love the wines. Now, what we're doing today is we're revisiting old favourites and recommending to you the best in their class at this very moment. Now, my first is this one, Montana Sauvignon Blanc from Marlborough in South Island, New Zealand. Now, if you were to look at the classic wines of the world, if you were to look at the classic Chardonnay, it comes from France. Look at the classic Pinot Noir, France. Classic Cabernet Sauvignon, France. Classic Sauvignon Blanc, New Zealand. Nothing can touch it. And I tell you, this is a 4 99 wine, and this is the business, the best in the world. Now, you get your nose in the glass. It's so gooseberry-ish, it's ridiculous. It's like gooseberries that have just started to simmer. They're still al dente. They've still got loads of fruit, loads of flavour. But it's not too aggressive. It's <gasps> mm. tart, but somehow sweet. It's big, but delicate. You know, it's sort of challenging, but cosy. It's the sort of wine I love. It's my desert island wine. Well, I'm going to go on to Eastern European whites. Now, we did a, a tasting a couple of years ago. We couldn't find a single Chardonnay or Sauvignon Blanc that we thought was actually any good. And suddenly there was a knock at the door, and this, this um, messenger, exhausted, staggered in from Heathrow, bearing these sort of medicine bottles full of this murky liquid. And we opened them up, and they were wonderful, tangy Sauvignon Blanc and soft, round Chardonnay. And they were the first wines made by Englishman Hugh Ryman, in Hungary. Now, we always used to think, well, the, the New World is Australia, New Zealand, California, all that. Well, New World's not just where you're situated. New World's also how you think. It's what your ambitions are. It's what your dreams are. And the New World is also now appearing in Slovakia. It's also appearing in Hungary and Moldova. I mean, little Moldova. Moldova's hardly bigger than Belgium, yet it's got three and a half times the vineyards of Australia. And most of those are planted in the great French varieties brought there 100, 150 years ago. Excuse me <laughs> while I spill wine all over Jilly. But what we get here is a lovely fresh wine. It smells of apricots. It's got a sort of lemon sherbet zizz running through it. Mm. And a little bit of clove spice from the oak as well. $2.99 a bottle. That's a new world worth fighting for. Now I'm going to look at Spain and our first red. Now the wine I've got in my glass is Vega de Mariz Valdepeñas Sensibel, and it costs £2.89. Now, Spain's wine fortunes have always gone up and down like a seesaw ride, and just as they began to take yet another plunge with Rioja prices soaring out of reach, along came Don Darius, Don Hugo, Don John, Don How's Your Father, Don Everything. They were very cheap, very seductive red wine with a classy, oaky taste, and that's what we were looking for. Now, Spain's got the great varieties. Tempranillo, that's the Rioja's mainstay. It's a fabulous grape, and mixed with oak, it gives those lovely vanillary, flute, fruity flavours. Down in Valdepeñas in the south, it's called Sensibel, and it's the grape of this wine. They've got the expertise, too, and most importantly, they've got the sort of economy which means they can make good wines very cheaply. Now, we've been through all those oaky wines, and they're delicious, don't get me wrong, but suddenly they've got the confidence to give us unadorned, Tempranillo or Sensibel, and this is it without oak. It's fruit all the way. It smells of butterscotch. Wow, it's good. It smells of cake. It's junior. It's easygoing. Mmm. I can't think of a plate of pizza or pasta without it. It's easy glugging, fruity, simple wine. But if you're absolutely devoted to the oaky taste, don't despair. There's still oaky ones about. The best at the moment, I think, is Tio Vito at only 2 49 this month. Right, Chilean Cabernet Sauvignon. I can remember the first time I tasted this stuff. It was like having a mouthful of uh, celestial essence of Allen and Hambury's blackcurrant throat pastels. And then you shove a bit of mint on that and a bit of a sort of enticing smokiness and you got it. Sort of red wine bliss on wheels. Well, I'm afraid it's not quite just a buzz any longer. Um, the Chileans have got rather successful, and they've started taking themselves a bit too seriously. Um, the red wines are based on the Bordeaux grapes on the whole, and I must admit, most of the wines are now tending to taste rather dry and austere in the Bordeaux way. But we've found one which is gloriously Chilean still, and that's the Tesco Cabernet Sauvignon. And you smell that one. Yes, you get you, there it goes. That sort of that great rush of blackcurrant is still there, and a nice round softness, a creaminess from the oak barrel. Mm. The fruit's all there, no hard edges, the wine's dry, but it's not serious. If you want the Chilean experience, this is it. Now to Michael's other winning recipe, the crafty chocolate cake. It was once demonstrated to be even quicker to make than a packet cake mix. 
the last furlong of a gruelling race. With the help of his food processor, food and drinks Michael Barry has sneaked in on the rails, and at the finish, he just has a length to spare over Lynn. A slight handicap, though, is that Michael's cake will take more than twice as long to bake as the challengers. Michael was heavily into Herman's Hermits at the time. I'd like you to meet two people who now both voted for the chocolate cake. They're Paul Middleton from Rotherham and Carol Ahara from Dumfries. Paul, you, uh, you do a bit of cooking yourself, don't you? Yes, I do quite a lot at home. Yeah. And you're a paver as well, aren't you? Yes. A man of many, many yeah, parts. Yeah, I do patios and driveways and I mix concrete every day and I just wondered if it would be as easy making this cake. <laughs> <laughs> Carol, where did you vote for it? Well, I'm a chocoholic. I love anything chocolate. In fact, this is the most crafty of all recipes, this chocolate cake. It's effortless to make, and it starts with six ounces of ordinary flour in the food processor. You can make it. This, by the way, is four tablespoons, four ounces of cocoa, not drinking chocolate. You can make it in a bowl with a whisk if you like. It doesn't take much longer. Four ounces of caster sugar, which is where the sweetness comes from. Two large eggs, size one or two, ideal for this. This is one of the things that makes this special, it's treacle, real treacle, blackstrap molasses. It's not golden syrup, it's the real McCoy, dark and black and rich and has not only a lovely flavor to add to the thing, but tends to keep the cake moist in the unlikely event of you keeping it for a while. This is a quarter of a pint of milk and the same quantity, another quarter of a pint of cooking oil. This is sunflower oil, so the whole cake effectively is polyunsaturated as well. Baking powder, this, this is a heaped tablespoon of baking powder, quite a lot of baking powder because it's not got any uh, rising agent in the flour. Now then, at this point you whisk it if you've got a bowl or mix it if you've got a food processor. And it's a good idea if it is a processor to stop halfway through and just give the whole lot a little wipe down so that everything gets mixed in thoroughly. Another little zip. And it's done. What you then do is take out the blade. It's important to do that because if you uh, forget to, when you're pouring the mixture into the cake tins, it can come out and give you a nasty cut. Ordinary greased cake tins, non-stick for choice, and as you can see, the batter pours out quite easily. It may look a bit unlikely as a cake mixture at this point, but it's going to work absolutely fine. I'll just scrape the bits out of that. Because there's no hard fat in it, it makes an extraordinarily healthy cake. A little tap down. Now those go into quite a moderate oven. Here are the oven times. It needs to cook for about 40 to 45 minutes in 325 Fahrenheit, 160 centigrade. That's about uh, 145 degrees with a fan oven, gas mark three. If you've got an arga, put that shelf in above it to stop things cooking too fast. As you can see, when it cooks, comes out absolutely perfectly risen and marvelously dark and rich inside but decorating well let's take one I've cooled already and add to it this is some double cream already whipped I'm going to add a little fromage fray because that not only adds a note of sharpness to the mixture but also reduces the uh, fat level the cholesterol level just about right it stays quite thick, you'll find, even though it's got the fromage fray added. Actually, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put some black cherry jam on there first, I think, and make, how about that bit of cherry jam before I put on the cream, and make a kind of instant black forest gatto. That seems like a nice idea. Then the cream mixture. I'll pile that in the middle. Spread it a bit, but if I'm lucky and clever when i put the lid on it'll squash all that just out enough to make it look lovely yes you can just see the cream there i think now then because it's our 200th birthday i've got a stencil with the 200 on it and some icing sugar you can make any pattern you like of course or you can just shake icing sugar over the top of it but that should tell you how old we are now then when you've cut it you find that it's a lovely, dark, rich, almost black color, this cake. And the, uh, see if I can do the waiter's trick, balancing four plates, there we go. The uh, 
the mixture of cream, cherries, balance, <laughs> and chocolate cake is ideal. Here we go. Now then, that's for the chocoholic. That's for the expert paver. I hope you find it isn't too much like paving stones. <laughs> and here are two more. I hope you enjoy that. And as the guests contemplate the cake, let me tell you, we've had a letter. We really, they are real letters, believe me, though most of these I'm not allowed to see. This is from Ms. Bowes of Cheltenham. It says, might I suggest for your 200th programme that we might be allowed to meet your washers up? No sooner said than done, Ms. Bowes. Follow me into outer darkness and I will affect the introductions. They do a most efficient job, says Ms. Bowes, uh, and everything is always spick and span. What are you laughing about? <laughs> spick and span doing the programme. So this is Susie, this is Alison, this is Ray, doing a grand job, at least I hope they are. Susie, are you <laughs> pleased with the team? Well, I am. I've burnt a few cakes and Ray's broken a few glasses. Raymond, so it's coming out well. of your pay. You'll be owing us this week. <laughs> you realise that, don't you? Just as they say in a restaurant, the plongeur is the most important person, so it is on this show, because not only wash up, they also style and design and keep a tight ship, as they say. Next on Food and Drink, a very special and classic encounter between Sheffield lorry driver John Wilcock and top chef Raymond Blanc, which we're showing for a special reason. In 1986, John Wilcock and Raymond Blanc set off on a tour of eastern France. John, who sadly died last year, was introduced to every level of French cuisine by Raymond, proprietor of the top-rated Manoir au Quatre Saisons near Oxford. In Raymond's home village, they stopped at a simple family-run restaurant to sample French pear tart. Is it plain flour what is used? You know, it's the self-raising flour. We use very little self-raising flours. Glue, eggs, flour, water, soap. Boom, finished. What do you need? To make it more complicated, no. we use a nice plain flour. The pastry will be crispy, will be flaky, and it will be delicious. The paste, Red. Don't you think it'd be better with a self-raising flour? No. Not quite as hard. Well, could I taste it? Mm. Don't you think it'd be lighter it's with a, a self-raising flour? No, it's so <coughs> beautifully flaky. It's lovely and crunchy and crispy. For God's sake, self-raising flour would be soft pastry, too soft. Too soft. Yes. Oh, but maybe I think I'd just prefer the self-raising flour, you know, mm. you know. John would not be budged. Next stop, lunch with Raymond's parents. Well, first of all, I want to introduce John. John Wilcox. Hello, Bonjour, Bonjour, Monsieur. Bonjour. 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 Extremely happy to welcome you home, and uh, I hope that you're going to enjoy our hospitality. Yeah, it's very nice okay. meeting you, Mother. <laughs> Parfait. Oh, do you want to just to test it, yeah? Madame Blanc is cooking Sunday lunch of pork and fresh vegetables. Everything seems to be ready for lunch. Yeah, well, it's nice and fresh, do not it? My father offers some uh, bouquet of parsley for my mother, not flowers, you know. Yeah. Does your father cook? No, my father is not, not allowed in the cuisine. He's yeah. absolutely. The most, uh, <laughs> it grows vegetables. But you see, this garden, John, will typify a Frenchman's house. Typical. Yeah. Well, do you see some low and some lawn anywhere? There's no, it's all vegetable. <laughs> you see, yeah. an Englishman will grow a beautiful lawn. A Frenchman will grow a beautiful garden. Yeah, I've exactly. noticed the apples over the other side. Okay. There's a nice yeah. smell round here. Oh, yes, yeah, just over the bed of thyme, actually, which is lovely. Ouais, papa, tu as un très joli euh, lit de, de mmh. thym. Vraiment, il est magnifique. Ah oui, absolument. Il est en pleine santé. Hein. On yeah. croirait la Provence. It looks like Provence in here, notre yeah. Franche-Comté. On previous trips, I'd asked for a salad, but not getting anything this, like this. This isn't the salary, salary as I know it. In... No, actually, it's called celeriac. It's a root vegetable. It's got a great big white bulb. And the taste is quite uh, stunning and very. Very enjoyed around here. Yeah. Actually, it grows. I, I grow them in my own garden in England, and they go very well. Mm. You can get them in any shop. They're very, very common. You can get yeah. them very easy. And they do beautiful salads, beautiful vegetables. Raymond, what is it what your mother's done with this pork? Just a lot of the pork, which is lined, the inside is lined with prunes, slightly soaked in armagnac and uh, lightly marinated. And what's it been marinated in? In Armagnac, I just told you, and uh, oh, we're going to use the juices wow. of the prune. Oh, okay. I see. Use that marinade, actually, to give yes. it juice. Is your mother just sealing it well, now? Well, just sealing it a little bit, yes. to give it a bit of color, which yes. will provide a bit more. It's going to be much more appetizing and for taste as well. So we half oil, half butter, and just sear for a little while. For very long, for more than you. You can, you can smell it now. Tell your mother it's... The, the Roman is coming up, yes, even now. 
Il pense que ça va être délicieux. Ah, enfin, <rire> c'est fort aussi. How long would it take to cook? Euh, pour Quand cuire la cuisson, oui. eh bien, oh, une, deux heures, hein, quand deux même. Heures. Deux heures, il faut que ça soit oui. mijoté. Oui. oui dans euh, le jus. Two hours at a very, very slow oui. oven. So the meat slow oven. oven. That's right, very slow oven. So the meat retain its more, uh, but stays most. Yes. Obviously, yeah. you don't want a hard hit, okay? So the just, vegetables. See, uh, look, John, that's a small technique, which is quite interesting. Because he's just using the tomatoes, pricking them. Yes. So during the cooking, the tomato will release slowly the juices. And they will help to provide the flavor, Anna? the background yes. of the taste, yes. and the color of yes. the juice as well. And is, is these uh, vegetables and the herbs, mm -hmm. are they what, the well, what your father's grown himself? Exactly. Well, you found the small paradise of food, actually, because everything grows in the yeah. garden. Everything mm. is grown in the garden. So yeah. look at that, how fresh it looks, how it is appetizing. fresh, isn't it? Just pouring the marinade juices. Yeah. It's a tiny bit of ammonia yes. juice. I can see that there's been no fat use or anything. Yes. Yeah, it's just mm. the right amount of fat yes. to feed it. That's all. Yes. No more. Voilà. Oh. Okay. Our first course was rather like a beautiful garden brought in on a plate. Oh, what about that? Lovely. Oh, ah, wonderful, no. oh, Magnifique. So you can understand where I got my skills from. Oh, so yeah, I can understand that. Mm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Tomatoes, mm. carrots, beetroots, celery. I can't wait to get my time 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 to get my to be, grow up to be a famous chef when he was a child? Jamais, non, jamais je pensais que Raymond serait un grand chef comme ça. Bien, je dis une chose, moi non plus. Un grand chef, c'est... Ouais, c'est une chance, une chance, j'ai la chance de découvrir, c'était... I, I was lucky enough mm. to discover that ability. Because as you know, I'm self-taught. I never had a, a chef over me who has uh, taken my hand and uh, shown me the path. I had to learn all, mostly by myself. Yeah, and obviously the, the skill of the mother and the, mm. the, uh, the early education within food I had has helped me tremendously. I mean, I'm so lucky man because I live in this lovely little village. My father is, a, is God's gardener. Yes. My mother is, is, is God's cook. I mean, they both. I mean, it's, and the food is so pure, yes. so fresh, yeah. mm. so beautifully cooked. Of course, I, I, I have learned in some way a, a lot out of it. The smell of the pork proceeded it. I couldn't wait to try it. Harry cut beans and wild mushrooms went with it. That's the offering. Oh. Oh. This is what I've been waiting okay. to taste the juice. So I'm going to try right. it with a spoon, this. <laughs> Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. So, John, we seem to have triggered some kind of interest. I see your eyes are sparkling. Oh, yeah, yes. because you started to convince me a little bit with the French fall, see. Mm. Oh, I'm not doing too badly, am I? Well, not too badly. <laughs> well, actually, it's not me. It's she your mother. Mm. Yes, and it's your mother what you've got to thank. <laughs> Maman, vraiment, c'est vraiment délicieux. Et je pense vraiment que tu es un des plus grands chefs que j'ai jamais rencontré. Oh. Okay. Merci, mon grand. John Wilcock, a food and drink regular, a delightful and honest man, who gave us all enormous pleasure in a series of celebrated encounters with great chefs. And that's just about it for this season. We'll be back with you in the autumn with a new series. In the meantime, have a great summer. We'll leave you with a look at some of the faces from Food and Drink's first 200 programs. See if they ring any bells. Until the autumn, from all of us, goodbye.
Michael Barry's all-time favourite recipe for chocolate cake is featured in the new issue of the Radio Times, which also contains complete listings for all television and satellite channels.